Okay, it's time to get started. As, as we were looking at this award and trying to come up with who it was that was going to win it, um, you know, we had all kinds of great nominees. We had a, a, a real interesting um, data collection effort. And as we looked at Steve, um, I just want to read some of the quotes of people that were describing Steve and his leadership style. First one is, my takeaway is that Steve is a genuine servant leader. He's a genuine team builder and caring leader focused on inclusion, development, and invests his time and energy in them. Another one, since he moved into the CEO role, he's transformed the executive leadership team to be a tight-knit and collaborative team where many say it's the most fun they've had as leaders and that he's the best people leader they've ever experienced. Another one, he's very self-aware and agile. He gets input from so many sources and is not afraid to pivot. He's a continuous learner, open to colleague feedback on how to do business. He's learning agile, asks a ton of questions, and always seeks input before coming to a decision. And finally, he's, he is inspirational to be around. He's a guy from Queens who is super humble, but an incredible leader. He's a great overall person, not just executive, who stays focused on the long term, not the short term results. So with that, I'm excited to present the 2022 Center for Executive Succession Leadership Legacy Award to Steve Squeary. Now the award comes with this fine trophy that you'll see in a minute, but more importantly, I think probably to Steve, is that CES will donate $10,000 to the charity of Steve's choice. And he's chosen the Monsignor McClancy Memorial High School through the Core Jesu Foundation Incorporated. So with that, congratulations, Steve, and welcome. Here's your award. Stick that right there. Thank you very much. Quite an honor. I appreciate it. And uh, I think you said some nice words, but I couldn't hear them. So. <laughs> Yeah, I was telling him the downside about being up here is you can't hear anything that's being said at the podium. So now we can actually have a conversation Good. and hear one another. So, um, so first question for you, Steve, and that is, uh, tell us about your leadership journey. So you started as a manager in the Travelers Check Group um, 38 years ago. Now you're the chairman and CEO. What can we learn from your journey about navigating a career? Well, I mean, you know, first of all, I think that uh, let me pro provide a little context in from a uh, sort of a little bit of a social perspective. I mean, I, I grew up in Queens and the donation is to my high school, which I'm still very involved in. I'm on the board of my high school and uh, it's, it's a really important thing for me. But I grew up in Queens. Uh, I was telling, uh, you know, to Dean, my, my grandparents were Italian immigrants and didn't, didn't write or speak English uh, and came to this country. And my father was actually the first one in his family to, to go to college, and in fact, in my neighborhood, I think my father was the only one that went to college. And so as, as I started off in my career, I went to Manhattan College, and as I started off in my career, what was really important for me was just to be able to get a job and you know, be able to support my family at, at some point. And you know, as, I, as I look back sort of on my career, I started at Accenture. Uh, so I spent four years at Accenture, and I came to American Express 38 years ago because I was looking for a stopgap until I figured out what I wanted to do. Uh, still haven't really figured out what I wanted to do, I guess, but 38 years later, I'm still at American Express. And you know, when I got to American Express, the thing I focused on the most was I always wanted to continue to learn, and I wanted to be challenged. And I think as I, as I look at my journey, my journey was one about looking for interesting assignments, being challenged and continuing to grow. And, you know, I've moved through the company without ever having the aspiration uh, to become CEO, without ever having the aspiration to, in fact, be in management. Um, it was all about growing. And, and I think that really helped me and, and kept me focused. And, and I was asked probably a couple of years ago to, to sort of reflect back on, you know, what it was that was important on the journey. And I think what was really important on the journey was self-awareness. I think being self-aware was so important. What were your strengths? What were your weaknesses? And being able to admit those to yourself. Being able to think about 
and, and be able to accept feedback. Feedback is so important. And you know, so many people are either afraid to give feedback or afraid to accept that feedback. Communicating. Um, you know, growing up where I grew up, um, you know, you could tell from my accent, um, I'm from the South. I'm from, I'm from Southern Queens. And, uh, you know, we didn't speak like everybody else in business back then. And so, you know, it's, uh, communication was important, but not only speaking, but, but listening. And thinking about when you were taking a job in the company, I always thought about what could I learn from it and what could I give back to the company? And I don't think a lot of people think about that. And I always thought about when I took a job, what did it prepare me for down the road? Um, did it prepare me for a bigger challenge? Did it prepare me for a bigger management job? And so I always like to take some risk with those jobs. But I never focused on the politics at work. And you hear a lot about sort of the palace intrigue, and I'm sure you've all watched Succession and so forth and so on. And usually that's a losing hand. Um, and for me, it was always about making people around me better um, and making the company better. And I'll just tell you one quick story, which I, I think sort of really helped my career. It was 1997, um, and Y2K was about to happen. Now, some of you weren't born. Uh, some of you have no idea what it was, but it was when, you know, sort of the year 2000 was going to occur. And most of the computer programs back in those days were only written with two digits. So, because to save space, right? So it was, so when it hit, you know, 2000, there was a fear that everything would sort of stop. And we had to rewrite so many programs. And I remember the CEO at the time, Harvey Golub, brought us all in a room and he asked, he had a bunch of senior executives, and I was, you know, I was senior, but not as much as some of the other guys. And he said, look, I need somebody in addition to their job to, to manage, you know, Y2K. And I looked around, I raised my hand, I said, I'll, I'll do it. And, you know, a couple of people said to me, you know, if you screw this up, your career is over. I said, if I screw this up, all our careers are over, okay? <laughs> and in looking around that room, I felt a lot more comfortable me doing it than them doing it. But it was, it was about taking a risk, right? And it was about learning more. And, you know, from there, I think it really just helped. But I think, you know, so many people say to me, my, my goal is to be CEO of a, a major corporation. It's a one in a million shot. Um, you know, American Express had 12 CEOs in 172 years, right? And then they got stuck with me. And, you know, the reality is, I just happened to be the right guy at the right time, um, you know, to, to take over this role. But I think what you should really focus on, and my, and my message to people as they think about moving forward in their career, become a better leader, become a better person. Um, and you do that by, con by committing to continually learning, and I think that's what's important. The minute you stop learning, you start dying. Okay, thanks. So is there anyone in particular that's been instrumental in guiding you in your path to success, and, and what has that support meant to you? Uh, you know, it was my parents. Um, my mother and father, um, you know, sacrificed their, their entire lives for myself and my three brothers. Uh, they worked, my father worked two jobs, my mother worked, uh, and they were really selfless. They were selfless. I mean, they, they wanted a better life for their children. And they, they, you know, sort of spoke to us about how important it was to have an education and how educated people could really move, could move forward. But I think most importantly, what they did is they, they instilled values in us. Treat people with respect and dignity. Treat people the way you wanted to be treated yourself. And, and I think that, that is so important. And you don't see a lot of that in business today. And, and you know, the reality is, yeah, I may be the CEO, but I'm no different than anybody else that works at the company. And uh, you know, as I mentioned, the award is really to recognize people that invest in leaders, and American Express is known for great leaders. Uh, what, what is it that defines a great leader? So you know, a great leader defines a vision for the company. And then a great leader defines that roadmap. And so if you think about it, and a lot of you probably take strategy courses, strategy is the roadmap to vision. I mean, that's what it is. And that's all well and good, but then you have to have passion, and you have to make sure that you can instill passion within the organization so that they know that you're behind this and that they can all get behind that vision as well. 
And if you get that far, then you have to realize if you're leading the company, if you want to lead, you have to be willing to serve. The company does not exist for your benefit. You exist to serve the company. You should inconvenience the one, that's you, to convenience the many. And that's not what we see all the time, right? You see a lot of situations where it's about the executive. It's not about the executive, it's about the company, it's about the culture, it's about the people. And if you can get past that, then what you need to do is you have to have some good judgment. You've got to be willing to be accountable. You've got to demonstrate cor courageousness. You've got to make courageous decisions, and you have to have integrity. Um, and, and that's what I think. And that's what, when I look for people, I look for people that no matter what the job is, because it doesn't matter what your job is, you have to create a vision for your organization of where you're going. No matter whether you're running an HR organization, you're running the legal team, no matter what you're running. And you have to make sure you can rally an organization around that. And that requires some passion, passion from you and then instilling passion in others. So that's how I've always looked at it and that's how I've tried to lead. Yeah, and so you've talked a little bit about what shaped you as a leader, and you've mentioned culture and the importance of culture. Uh, I want to kind of flip it around and say, so how do you shape or drive change in a culture at a company that's 170 years old? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, when you think about a company that's 170 years old, you think about a state and, you know, sort of, uh, culture or uh, product, but you have to remember, um, you know, American Express, when it started, started as a freight forwarding company. That's what we started as, a freight forwarding company. Uh, we used to move freight from New York to the West Coast. It was started by Wells and Fargo. I guess they got tired and set up another company uh, as well, right? And, and, you know, we've morphed through the years, but I think, you know, what's happened with our company, it was always about service. It was always about security, and so we built on that. But when I took over as CEO, um, you know, I've been in the company, I've been in the company 38 years. I mean, that's a long time. Um, and, you know, there were things I liked and things I didn't like about it. And so what I did when I first took over is I went to the top 100 executives in the company and I said to them, tell me what we should do more of, tell me what we should stop. I met with each one of them for 45 minutes. Tell me what you hope I'm gonna do. Tell me what you're afraid I'm gonna do, which is really important, and whatever else is on your mind. And so I met with all the top leaders in the company. I went around to 18 countries, um, probably met with 12 to 1,500 people, and got their views on what kind of company that they wanted. And you know, when I came back, and I had been there, you know, look, 33 years up until that point, we put together this sort of framework, which we called our framework for winning. And it had our strategic priorities, it had how we're gonna win, it had the leadership behaviors we want, it had our blue box values, the values of the company that really established the culture. And the title of it was really important because I wanted our culture to be a winning culture. Not a culture of we had some problems, we had some problems, we, we lost Costco and we were battling back and we lost, we had, you know, we had uh, the financial crisis and we were battling back. And people were getting used to battling back. I didn't want people to battle back. I wanted people to be invested in winning. And as I went around the company, what I realized is that we didn't have everybody invested in winning. And we didn't have everybody invested in winning because we didn't have everybody economically invested. Only half the company was getting bonuses. And so one of the first things I did as, as CEO was not only introduce this framework, but basically for all of our, all of our, all of our colleagues who weren't getting bonuses, over 40,000, put them on that, put them on an incentive plan. You talked a little bit about some of the decisions you made during the pandemic that actually created um, value in coming out of the pandemic. No, so what's interesting about, um, you know, sort of COVID, and, you know, you never really start with what's, in, what's interesting about COVID, but what was interesting about the pandemic is I think it caused a reexamination, right? And I'll tell you two quick things. When I started as CEO, one of the things that, because I was on my predecessor's executive team, and we'd have staff meetings and meetings, and people would call in from all over the place. You'd be in Singapore, you'd be in London, you'd be here, you'd call in. And I remember how I used to call in. I'd be like half asleep, not paying attention, and so forth. So what I decided to do when I took over was I said, my direct reports will be in one week out of the month. One week, we're all gonna be in. We called it meetings week, and we're all gonna be in. You can't be out. I mean, you have a family emergency, obviously, okay, you can be out. 
but you knew in advance that this was the week of the month that, that we were going to meet. The other three weeks, do what you want. And so it was a really good test case because it created, so we're in 25% of the time as a team, 25% of the time. It created a concept of team like I've never seen in my, up until that point, my 33 years at American Express. Because we were engaged, we were together, we were in for purpose, we were meeting, it was terrific. 20% of our workforce pre-COVID was virtual, okay? And all of a sudden, on you know, March 15th, everybody's virtual. 63,000 people at the time, completely virtual, nobody's in, right? So as we thought about it, we were successful. We had, you know, in 2021, 2021 was the most successful year in the company's history. In 2020, we, we, thr you know, we, did, we did well compared to everything else that was going on. So as we started to think about how we were gonna bring people back in, in 2022, we made a decision as a team that we were going to allow more virtual. We were gonna absolutely allow more virtual. We were definitely gonna to go to hybrid. So what we've said to people is, come in for purpose. So if you're gonna come in and sit on a WebEx or sit on a Zoom, don't come in, stay home. You could do that at home. But when you're in, meet with people, interact with people. Go to lunch, do this, do that, do the other thing. And so I think the biggest change that'll occur is people that don't, in my opinion, that don't take this on um, are not gonna be able to get the most talented people. I mean, look, there's some jobs that you're gonna have to be in five days a week, you know, you're the security in the building, you're what have you, right? But a lot of jobs you don't need to be in five days a week. And, and I think that's, that's what you have to embrace. And I think if you do that, you will, um, you know, make sure you're getting the most talented people. And you have to set good goals. You have to make sure you have good measurement systems. But if you do that and you trust people, I think it'll work. Uh, I will say this has been an incredible opportunity for the students to hear from, uh, from you as a leader. Uh, I think uh, the values that you articulated today uh, are inspirational to a lot of these students. And hopefully what they'll take away, if nothing else, is that they don't know everything because I think they think they do right now. So uh, with that, thank Thanks. you so much, Steve. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much.